feel like we should uh, we should have some music in the beginning here. <laughs> for next time. Um, so we are just about to get started. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Rhiannon Adams. I am a supporter of the Lowell School Hospital Women's Society, and I am a co-chair of the Development Committee. For those of you who don't know, the Lowell School Hospital Women's Society is a group of women in all ages and stages of life who are passionate about and committed to supporting excellence in women's healthcare and treatment. The Women's Society raises awareness and funds for important initiatives at the Lowell School Hospital for Women here in Edmonton. We host this Mind and Body Talks as an inclusive speaking series to engage and stay connected to our community. So with that said, uh, we would like to introduce you to one of our uh, Women's Society supporters to share a bit about why she chooses to be part of this community. As a member of the Development Committee, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Brianna Botsford. Hi, thank you, Rhiannon, and thank you everyone for being here at tonight. Um, my name is Dr. Brianna Botsford, and I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I'm an athlete and brand new mom here in Edmonton. Um, I became a Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society monthly supporter about a year and a half ago now, but I first became involved with the society about two years ago. Initially, I was involved um, with one of these What the Health events um, back in the olden times when we did these things uh, in real life um, and we got to connect in person. Um, although I do see many benefits to being online and being able to connect with people um, all over Alberta and not just locally. So it's great that we're able to still do this. Um, I became a supporter um, because I'm passionate about women's health. Um, I want the best for women who are living in Alberta. And I believe that by supporting the Lois Hole Hospital for Women, um, and specifically the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society, that we can do that. Um, when I first became a supporter, we were working on funding the OBICS perinatal monitoring system, um, which allowed folks um, who are living rurally, uh, pregnant folks who are living rurally to connect with um, their care provider and um, Edmonton at the Lois Hole, um, their care providers there so that they didn't have to make so many trips into Edmonton. And I, I think this piece of technology is incredible and that it uh, enables providers at Lois Hole Hospital to provide top-notch care to women all over um, Northern Alberta. Um, our monthly supporters and our generous donors made that happen and that I'm just so grateful for that. Um, earlier this year, I was pregnant with my first baby and I actually became a patient at the hospital um, when my water unexpectedly broke at 36 weeks, which is a little early. Um, not crazy early, but early enough when you're thinking you're going to term. Um, and so I'm beyond grateful to the nurses and the staff at the hospital because our little guy is perfectly healthy and happy, even though he came a whole month early. And, you know, I was just grateful to have the um, support of the NICU there um, if we needed it, which we we did not. Um, but, you know, having such an amazing hospital um, is really important. And I know that um, as a monthly supporter, uh, we're able to fund research and innovation um, so that our our families, our daughters, um, ourselves can have ongoing excellence in our care. So let's continue to fund this research and innovation and support patients in our community. Thank you. Thanks, Brianna. You like, give me goosebumps. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I love hearing um, every time why people are supporting the Women's Society, um, because I think it's just, so great to hear about the positive stories that are coming out. So thank you. Um, now, before we dive into tonight's session, I wanna go over a bit about how the evening will go um, and talk about a few housekeeping notes. So tonight we're honored to have Shannon Netterfield with us. She is a, a public educator from the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton, so also known as SAFE. Uh, and she is also the public education team lead, so she's pretty important stuff. <laughs> um, we're hoping that tonight that you come away with or come away from this presentation feeling educated and empowered with some really good resources. So this is a safe space 
for everyone to come and ask questions and have those questions answered. At the end of the session, we will have a Q&A portion hosted by my Women's Society Development Co-Chair, Crystal. So if you have any questions for the speaker, we're just gonna ask that you put them in the chat box and then Crystal will go through them uh, at the right moment. This lecture is being recorded. So it's being recorded as we speak. Uh, it will be posted on the uh, Foundation's YouTube tomorrow. We are using the live transcript option, which you need to enable if you want to use it. Uh, it's not 100% accurate, but it's helpful for inclusivity. Tonight's webinar is also using Zoom's webinar feature. So someone did ask in the chat earlier about whether or not they're muted. Um, but this webinar feature means that uh, each of the panelists will appear. So I'm assuming I'm on your screen and just me uh, when, when we speak. Um, so you don't need to worry about your video or being muted. So enjoy the experience this evening. That's it for housekeeping. But before we really get started, uh, I also want to send our thanks to Alberta Blue Cross for their continued support to run this series. We wouldn't do it without that support. So um, from Alberta Blue Cross, we have Narissa Kanji, who's going to bring us some lovely greetings. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Narissa Kanji, Community Impact Manager at Alberta Blue Cross, and I wanna welcome you all to What the Hell, Mind and Body Talks. Super excited to be here with you tonight. Um, at Alberta Blue Cross, we're really, really happy to be part of this program that inspires, empowers, and engages women in a safe space to have these topics. And I'm really excited to hear from Shannon Netterfield today on this important and timely topic. Before we get started, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. Today and every day, we respectfully acknowledge that we're on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory. We recognize that the city of Edmonton and us, the people here, are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of numerous Western Canada First Nations, such as the Cree, Sato, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. We are taking this important moment here today to acknowledge all the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Thank you. Thank you, Narissa. I now have the honor of introducing our speaker to you this evening, Shannon Netherfield. Shannon, as I said, is a public education, or is the public education team lead with SAFE. She is a graduate from the University of Alberta's University of Alberta's Department of Women's and Gender Studies. And Shannon has been involved in anti-violence work since 2015. She's also trained in crisis intervention and supportive listening. At SACE, Shannon utilizes this valuable experience to deliver educational sessions to youth, to adults, to community groups, and to professionals. And we are honored, as I said, to have you here today. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I feel very welcomed. Great. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here today with people um, from Edmonton and from all around Alberta. That's so exciting. And I think um, I'll just go ahead and start sharing my screen here. It'll take me a second once that happens to, um, to kind of get my screen sorted again. But we will do that as quickly as possible. Great. Okay, so it looks like that should be working. It's going to get things situated here. Thanks for the nods. That's helpful. Great. Okay, so you know that my name is Shannon. That's been said a couple of times. My pronouns are she and her. And I am a public educator with um, the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton. Very happy to be on that team. For folks who are less familiar with our agency, basically SACE exists for two reasons. One of them is to support people who have experienced sexual violence of any kind. It might be what we're talking about today. It could be sexual harassment or maybe photos that were shared around, anything at all. And we also exist to go out into the community and talk with people about these topics. So that's what I'm doing today. 
And in particular, I've been invited here to provide a brief introduction to the topics of sexual assault, trauma, and how we can supportively respond when somebody tells us that they've experienced something like this. So what's coming up next on this screen is, oh, hopefully, there we go, is my ambitious outline for the evening. I hope that we, and we'll, we'll absolutely be able to talk about all of these things, depending on how time is going. I may go into more or less depth, but absolutely we'll have um, a really meaningful opportunity to engage with all of these things on the screen. So we'll start by clarifying exactly what we mean when we say consent and sexual assault, and then we'll actually move into a conversation about trauma. So what trauma is, as well as some potentially common responses to trauma that some people might have. And that's actually where we'll spend most of our time talking today, as well as in our conversation about um, how we can respond if somebody tells us that they've experienced something like this, including having some options kind of in the back of our mind or know where to find different community resources in case that person wants to reach out to those. And I wanna say too, that this topic can be very difficult to talk about, Tonight, we're not spending a whole, whole bunch of time in it, but any amount of time talking about things like sexual assault and trauma can feel really heavy. If that's the case for you, that's so completely normal. And I would just want for folks to know that, of course, your, um, your participation in this session and being here is voluntary. So if you need to step away, that's completely okay. Um, if you need to go get a drink, have a snack, like mute for a second so you don't hear me, that's completely okay. Uh, look away from the screen. Whatever you have to do is completely okay. Um, yeah, completely okay by me. So we're actually just going to dive in. And the first thing that we are going to touch on is this idea of consent. I think that probably people here are familiar with this word. Like you've definitely heard it before, especially lately. People have been talking about it quite a lot. But what exactly is it getting at? And actually in Canada, our understanding of consent has evolved over the years. So you folks might be familiar with this phrase, like no means no. You've probably heard that before. This was um, a slogan that kind of came out of the 80s. It was an anti-sexual harassment slogan. And actually at that time, it was really radical to be at that place with our understanding of consent. And of course, no does mean no, like it's not inaccurate at all. But there are a couple of issues with it. First of all, that no can actually be expressed in a lot of different ways without using the word no. So that might be with someone's body language or with different words that they use. So maybe somebody just kind of makes an excuse or maybe someone just kind of turns away. Those things actually count as no in our law and different things like that. So it's a little bit limited in that way. As well, it actually, no means no, puts the onus on the person who's being harmed, who's in a very threatening and scary situation to say no. It might not be safe for them to say no in that situation. And as we'll talk about later, when we get into our conversation about trauma, they might not even have access to those words. So in those two ways, the phrase no means no is a little bit limiting. So because of those issues, we actually moved on to saying only yes means yes. And that's pretty great. Maybe some folks have heard that before too. And this was a huge step forward because now the onus is actually on the person pursuing the sexual contact to make sure that the person they're interested in is saying yes or is consenting. However, there's also some important kind of nuances, I guess, to consider with this as well, particularly that sometimes people say yes when they really want to say no. So whether it's to keep themselves safe, to preserve that relationship, or because maybe they've been manipulated into agreeing in some way. So at this point, our understanding of consent has actually kind of also moved past yes means yes, a bit of an evolution here. And according to today's law, I'm just going to pop it up on the screen there, consent is a voluntary agreement to engage in sexual contact. And so the word voluntary here is meaning that sexual activity of any kind is only okay if someone is saying yes to that sexual activity because they really want to do that thing. And that's it. Not because they've been forced to, manipulated or coerced to in any way. So it doesn't actually matter if somebody says yes. What matters is if that person wanted to say yes and wanted to agree. So this means that, yeah, if someone maybe is pressured, so somebody asked them over and over and over again, and then they agreed, or if somebody's guilted, like, I thought you loved me, I thought you cared about me, why don't you want to do this with me? You've done this with other people, what's wrong with me? Those things um, if somebody's threatened, like, oh, I'll end this relationship, if they're blackmailed, I'll share this secret that you have around, I'll share this photo around. If somebody agrees after experiencing those things, it actually doesn't count as consent. 
So that's kind of where we are right now with consent. And I'll also, we've already talked about this, but yeah, that's why the word voluntary in the definition is so important. And when sexual contact happens without consent, it's considered sexual assault. So I'm going to briefly touch on the definition of sexual assault here. And again, I think this is a term that lots of people have heard before. But something that I experience in my in my role here is that while people are often at least a little bit familiar with this term, sometimes they actually, the definition can still be surprising for them. So in my experience, a lot of the time when people hear the term sexual assault, they like automatically think of one other word. And probably that word is also coming to your mind as well. It starts with an R and probably you're thinking about the word rape. And that makes so much sense because out in the world, sexual assault and rape are used interchangeably, like to mean pretty much the exact same thing. That makes a lot of sense, especially with all of the different laws that exist in the US and in Canada, it's really easy to get all of that mixed up. But here in Canada, rape actually refers to a really specific thing which is forced penetration of any kind. So when that happens, it counts as sexual assault. But there are a bunch of other things that also count as sexual assault when they happen. And the definition here in Canada is actually a lot broader and more inclusive than just talking about rape. So I'm gonna pull that up on the next screen here. And in fact, sexual assault is any sexual contact that happens without voluntary consent. So not just forced penetration, but anything at all that happens when somebody didn't want it to happen. So I'm going to pull up four really specific things that count as sexual assault when they happen. The first one here is forced oral contact or like kissing. The second one is unwanted touching, grabbing, and groping of sexual body parts. Unwanted oral genital contact or oral sex. And the last one is what we've already talked about, which is forced penetration. And sometimes people will use the word rape, and that's okay too. So again, for some people, they're surprised to hear that all these different things are included in our law here in Canada, that all these different types of unwanted sexual touching are protected. And we're trying to make it so that that doesn't happen for people here. And you might notice too that up on the screen here, like for, for point number one, for example, instead of just saying kissing, we have up on the screen like forced oral contact. And I think that probably folks can think of a couple different reasons why that might be the case. Um, and really the reason is because we wanna make it really clear that there's actually a big difference between healthy consensual sexual contact like kissing and forced oral contact, that they feel really, really different. And so when we're supporting somebody who's experienced, actually, when we're talking about this topic kind of just in general out in the community, we usually would recommend that folks default to this non-consensual language. That's what we call this here. Um, again, just to make that distinction pretty clear. So calling it forceful contact, calling it sexual assault, unwanted touching, whatever that might be. That being said, when we're in a situation where we're supporting somebody, we can actually mimic whatever language they're using to talk about what happened. So if somebody says, I was kissed and I really didn't want that to happen, it's not very helpful to say like, no, that's not a kiss, that's forced oral contact. We don't need to do that. And it's okay to just kind of be where that person is at in their conversation. So that's another piece that we can carry forward with us as we move forward in our presentation here. As well, we'd also usually like to talk about another piece of language when it comes to talking about sexual assault and consent and people who experience or maybe do those things. At SACE, we always default to person first language. And I think that probably some folks are familiar with that. What that means is that we're talking about the person instead of necessarily the thing that happened to them or labeling as labeling them as that thing. So there have been lots of different words to talk about people who experience sexual assault. For example, kind of started off with the word victim that's still used in a lot of different spaces too. And that makes sense. A lot of people are like, yeah, like something happened to me. It was bad. That is validating to be called a victim in that situation. Whereas for others, it's a bit disempowering. So then people started to switch over to this word called survivor. Absolutely way more empowering. But then for other folks, they feel like, well, at what point have I survived? When do I get to say that I'm a survivor? It doesn't really feel like that. So there are so many different words that we can use in this situation. But again, for these reasons, for these kinds of issues, we typically just uh, would say person who experienced sexual assault or whatever it is that they experienced. And also we would use that for the person who did it as well, person who used offending behavior as well, just as an example. 
Okay, this is a lot of information. We'll move forward here. And the next piece that we'll kind of roll into here is starting to talk about trauma because when sexual assault happens to people and their consent and their boundaries are violated, it is often a traumatic event for them. It might not always be, but it, it absolutely can be. And that does happen quite often. So here we're gonna talk a little bit about, yeah, what trauma is, and then again, some common impacts that we might notice in somebody. So an event is traumatic when it overwhelms a person's ability to process and cope with what's happening. So it actually isn't the event itself that is traumatic, but rather it's our bodies and our brains responses to that event or response to that event. So two people could actually experience the exact same event. And for one person that might be a traumatic experience and for somebody else it might not be. And that's just kind of how trauma works. So traumatic events have a really particular biological impact on the body. That is, they take us out of our normal regulated state where we have some control over our state of mind and our behaviors, and it triggers, it, sorry, it triggers instinctual responses. So these instinctual responses have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to keep us safe, to keep us safe in times of danger. And they're really effective and they allow the brain and the body to, resp to respond to things really, really quickly. But the downside is that because they are instinctual physiological responses, they are only there are only a handful of ways that somebody or that the brain and the body can actually choose to respond. So that might be fight, that might be flight, and that might be freeze. And I think that those words might not necessarily be new to everybody here. If they are, that's okay too. And a really important piece of this that we always like to focus on is that we actually have no control over what response our body will choose in a moment of threat. When an event is traumatic for a person, the impacts of the event actually outlive the actual experience of the event. So this means that days, weeks, months, even years later, there can be neurobiological trauma responses to memories or reminders of that traumatic event, and that's really normal. So here at SACE, we think that it's really important for people who are, you know, potentially receiving disclosures or supporting somebody out in the community, a friend, family member, a stranger, whoever that might be, to have some understanding of trauma and the nervous system for two reasons. One is that it provides us with tools to maybe normalize and validate the experiences of the person you're supporting. And because trauma responses can be really confusing, both for the person who's experiencing them and for the person supporting, if we don't really know what's going on for that person. So what we're gonna talk about next here are some of those common trauma impacts that can be the most confusing for people who are supporting somebody who's experienced something like this. So we know that this isn't an exhaustive list, and we're going to kind of touch on that a little bit at the end of this particular conversation, but just kind of pointing out a few things that can be really helpful for people to be aware of if we're ever in this situation where we're supporting somebody. The first one is that it's actually really common for people to not fully remember the event that happened. So that might be parts of the event or maybe even all of the event. And actually sometimes for people, the memory of the event comes back later. And there's so much that we could talk about there too. But the reason for this is actually, again, physiological because trauma changes the way that the, that the brain operates. So an example that uh, we like to use here at SACE is that everyday experiences are remembered by the brain almost like we have like a video camera going. So for a typical day, you could maybe play back the tape, think about this morning, maybe you see yourself getting up, you had breakfast, you brushed your teeth, you got the kids off to school, whatever situation you're in. There's a beginning, there's a middle and an end, there's context, and it's basically chronological for the most part. On the other hand, when something traumatic happens, our body actually turns off our prefrontal prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that's responsible for decision making and rationality. And so the reason that this part of our brain doesn't operate in a moment of trauma is because it's actually pretty slow at making decisions compared to those instinctual responses, fight, flight, and freeze that I talked about earlier. So we can actually respond to a threat seven times faster if we use our instincts instead of needing to like think through and assess the situation. So again, the advantage is speed of response, but the downside is that it disrupts the processes within our brain that actually store memory. 
So for this reason, recalling a traumatic event is actually more like having an old school film camera. I don't know if anybody uses those anymore, maybe a Polaroid camera, as opposed to a video camera. So it would be like kind of going through your day, taking snapshots, waiting for them to get developed, having them thrown out on a table and being asked to, to kind of put them back together in a chronological cohesive story. The pictures are out of order. There might be periods of time where no picture was taken. Some of the pictures you um, might just kind of be random images with no context at all, and there's nothing to indicate maybe the time of day or the flow of the day. This is similar to how our brain stores memories when something traumatic has happened. So for us, it's important to know that when people who have experienced sexual violence are asked to recall or retell what happened, it can be really hard for them to do that in the kind of detail that one might expect for such an impactful experience. And it's reasonable for that to be confusing for the person hearing that, if you're not aware that that's how the brain stores memories when we've experienced something scary. So for the person who has been harmed, this can be incredibly frustrating and very confusing and really upsetting. And it can, again, also be frustrating and confusing for the support person or the person who's trying to understand what has happened for that other person. It's important to know that, you know, if we're ever in this type of situation and we're noticing like, oh, like that person's not like the story's kind of out of order or the second time they told that story, the order was different or there's new details or different details, that it's not that person being difficult or being withholding or lying. It's just that incomplete, out of order, fragmented memory is actually a hallmark of trauma. So the next piece here is that it's also really common for people who experience sexual assault to wait before they come forward. In fact, many people don't disclose that anything happened immediately and only come forward after maybe months or even years have passed. And I think that probably a lot of people in this, in this meeting here are, you know, like really compassionate, empathetic people. And we can imagine what might be really difficult about coming forward after an experience like this. Like not to mention the fact that it's probably pretty private, that thing that happened, typically it's difficult to talk about sexual things in general, never mind if it's actually an act of violence. But that person might also be experiencing some fear, some fear of retribution. Again, they might be having trouble remembering exactly what happened. And two, like I mentioned, their memories might not actually come up until later. So there wouldn't be anything to tell until later. It might involve um, also to the, the situation that harmed them could involve somebody that maybe they were in a relationship with and they couldn't really process the fact that that happened until they had some distance from that person or that thing. Um, and also too, I think this might be something that maybe people experienced with the most recent Me Too movement. It's just as an example of this, but sometimes people actually come forward in response to hearing about other people's experiences because it's less scary and it's, well, it's less scary to not feel like you're alone or maybe you would feel like somebody is less alone and because there's power in those numbers. So it's very, very common. Um, something again that we'll touch on is, you know, sometimes people say like, oh, if this had been such a serious thing, they would have come out about it right away. Lots of people feel that way. And again, that makes sense if we don't understand that this is actually really common for people who've been harmed in this way. It's also really common for, um, this actually isn't up on the screen there, but this is connected to waiting before somebody comes forward. It's also really important to note that once people do come forward, it's actually pretty common for them to recant that thing. So they might change their mind after making a report. They might not actually wanna pursue, pursue that report, whether that was to the police or that was to like, um, like a college or a body in their workplace, whatever that might be. And they might even say that it didn't actually happen. And this is common for people of all ages. And in general, people often confuse this behavior for and mistake it for somebody lying. But recanting is distinctly different from lying about abuse. And in fact, we know that it's very, very rare for somebody to lie and say that a sexual assault has happened when it hasn't. There's been extensive research on this. And we know that 92 to 98% of the time when someone makes a report about sexual assault, they're actually telling the truth. I could talk about that for so long. So if there's questions about that, let me know. But yeah, there are lots of reasons why we can think of why somebody might choose to recant their story. So maybe they had a really bad experience when they were disclosing. Um, maybe they are experiencing some of those retributions. Maybe they don't wanna have to continue going through that process that they started. It's just too difficult for them, whatever it might be. The third one on there is that out of all of the different instinctual responses, 
freezing is much more common when it comes to sexual assault than fight or flight. And it's the most common response that people experience when it comes to sexual assault. And that's true of people of all genders. And it happens with sexual assault more than any other type of assault. And this makes sense for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that we know that most of the time when sexual assault happens, this is another little statistic um, nugget here, 85% of the time when sexual assault happens, it happens between people who know each other. There's often maybe some kind of attachment or trust there. So it's actually really hard for like the simple instinctual part of our brain to process what's happening when the person who's causing the harm is also someone that we have that kind of attachment or trust with. So if this is the case, if freezing is the most common response to a sexual assault, then we can imagine that someone coming forward about this, um, questions like, did you say no? Did you fight back or did you run away? Are pretty unhelpful because for many people, many, many people, those options just weren't available to them. And we had our conversation about consent earlier. So we know that in Canada, we actually have an affirmative standard of consent. So what that's getting at is that consent is not the absence of a no, fighting back or run away. It's the presence of a voluntary, um, enthusiastic yes or participation agreement to do that thing. The last thing here on this slide that I wanted to mention is that people who disclose experiencing sexual assault have just like a wide range of emotional responses and reactions to that. So we often see depictions, you know, when we see a sexual assault depicted in a movie or someone who's experienced that um, in the media of any kind, usually it is a woman as well, which is its own kind of issue. But if that person has experienced sexual violence, then often this person is really emotional. They're crying, they're very afraid, and you can see that it's had an impact on them. It's very, very clear and obvious to us. This can certainly happen, it absolutely does. And also responses can look really different. So some people might actually minimize the experience. Maybe that's to feel safer or because they just can't cope with it yet. So it's actually really common for someone to maybe laugh it off, to talk about it with very little emotion or to seem like they're really distanced from the experience, maybe even really calm. And sometimes people will even defend or make excuses for the person who hurt them. And again, that makes sense if we know that most of the time they probably had some kind of connection with that person and how confusing that can be. And as well, for many people, their emotional impacts, um, the way that they express those emotions can also change over time, day to day, maybe even minute to minute. And that's just completely normal. So all of this is to say that there is no wrong way to respond after somebody experiences sexual violence. So even when somebody isn't acting the way that we imagine that they should, um, that doesn't mean that they're lying. It doesn't mean that their response is wrong in any way. I mentioned earlier that sometimes, you know, we hear things like if it was really serious, this person would have reported, they would have come forward right away, they would have not gone back to work, whatever that might be. But responses to trauma are as varied as the individuals themselves. So when we know there's so much variance in who somebody is and a perceived lack of impact on our part does not mean that the person isn't in fact impacted by the experience and all of the different responses that somebody might have after this kind of situation are signs of resiliency in that person moving forward after what happened. So with that kind of in mind, really, these conversations or this information that I'm providing about consent, sexual assault, and this little bit here about trauma, even just knowing this stuff can be so helpful when it comes to supporting somebody who's experienced something like this. And that's what we're going to talk about next here. So what I want to do is just everybody kind of on your own, just in your head, just take a moment. And I want you to think about a time when you had a problem, whatever that problem might be, might have been a huge problem, might have been like, I don't know, I, I lost a piece of paper that I needed. And maybe that's less serious, whatever it is. You can think about a problem that you had. And you think about a time when you went to somebody for support for that problem. You told them about what was happening and they really helped you. You felt really supported by that person. So take a moment now to think about that. And I want us all to think about like, what was it that that person did that was so helpful for you? Just think about this in your head. And if you can't think of an example, that's okay too. But maybe imagine what you would have liked for somebody to do.
And I want us just to kind of carry that, that kind of feeling forward with us in our in into this next part of the presentation today. And kind of, yeah, hold that memory with you there. Because I think we'll see some of that stuff come up here in our conversation. Because sometimes here at SACE, when we talk to folks about responding to disclosures, it I mean, first of all, that phrase responding to disclosure sounds can sound pretty intense, but really all we're having with somebody is, is a conversation. And really what we're doing is being there and listening to that person. But people can get really, really stressed and they can feel really worried that they'll say the wrong thing or maybe make things worse or just not be a good enough support. And that comes from such a beautiful place of somebody wanting to be the best support that somebody can have. And we actually know that the things that help somebody feel supported can actually be pretty simple and they don't have to be informed by years of knowledge on trauma or the law around sexual assault, even though those things can be very, very helpful. Because supporting someone isn't about having all the answers or being able to fix the problem for somebody. And in fact, this probably isn't something that we're going to be able to do for that person. So instead, we can focus on doing three things. We can listen to that person we can believe them, and we can support them. On the next slide here, I'll talk a little bit more about each of those three things. So I think for most people, it sounds really easy or straightforward to listen to somebody. You're just sitting there, you're letting them talk, that's easy. But it can be a little bit more difficult. There's a couple of things we like to tell people. One is that it's actually pretty common for there to be lots of moments where maybe the other person isn't talking, you're not talking, and as the person doing the supporting, you feel it maybe like you need to fill in that space. Like it feels awkward and really uncomfortable. It's natural for that to feel uncomfortable, but the other person is actually very, very likely using that time to think through like what they want to tell you. Or maybe they're even thinking through which words they want to use to describe this thing that happened. Maybe this is the first time they're talking about it. And because like it says up there on the screen, full disclosures, the first time that somebody talks about it is actually pretty rare. It's really common for somebody to only feel comfortable telling certain parts at certain times or to certain people. So it's really common for people to need some time to sort through, well, which parts of this do I feel comfortable talking about right now? So those are a couple pieces about listening that can be helpful. And as well, too, if we're listening, then we're not really asking a lot of our own questions, too. So we're letting that person literally just tell us what they want to tell us without us kind of dictating the story in any way and pulling out certain pieces of it that we're maybe really interested in. We just want them to tell us what they want us to know. So for the, the next piece here, I mentioned how it's so, so rare for people to lie about an experience of sexual assault. So it can be so, like, one of the most important things for a lot of people can be to feel like the person they're talking to believes what they're telling them is true. Doesn't think that they are making it up for attention or exaggerating what happened, or is just angry at the other person and is trying to get revenge or something like that. Instead, it can be so helpful for you as the supportive person to be in that state of just believing what that person is telling you is true. And something that can be helpful in that process is for us to be mindful of our roles when we're supporting somebody. So if we're supporting a friend, colleague, whatever it is, we're not like a police officer in that situation. We don't need to collect evidence. We're not in some kind of position where we need to decide whether or not this happened for this person. We just don't need to do that we're actually in the best position ever where we just get to be a support and a friend to that person. So that can help too with that piece of believing that person. And we'll talk about some phrases we can use in a second here. But this last one here as well is kind of just this all encompassing idea of just kind of being there for somebody. It's what it says up here is that to never underestimate the power of just being present and being there and listening and believing somebody and just being there as a support person. And this kind of leads me to the next piece here, which is that, again, people can get very worried if, because they do want to be the best support person ever, and that's just completely reasonable. It really is very understandable. But like I mentioned, the things that are actually really supportive to somebody can be very, very simple. So a couple of the things up here are, I believe you. It's not your fault. 
I'm here for you. How can I help you? So again, this I believe you piece, communicating that you're not questioning whether or not what they're telling you is true. You know that the majority of the time when people report, they tell the truth about that thing. When we're communicating that it's not somebody's fault, then that means that we're actually putting the onus on the person who did the harmful thing instead of on the person who experienced it. I can imagine that a lot of folks here are really familiar with the term victim blaming, or at least you've heard that before. This idea of victim blaming is putting the blame and the responsibility for what happened on the person who experienced the harm instead of on the person who did the harm. So saying things like, you know, it wouldn't have happened if you weren't at that party. Wouldn't have happened if you weren't drinking, if you were wearing something different, if you weren't by yourself, if you had bear spray. But when we're saying that, we can think about like, who are we focusing on in that conversation? And who are we not putting any attention on? And we're not putting any attention on the person who actually did the harmful behavior. And so if we want to move forward and actually take action against sexual violence, then we need to hold the appropriate people responsible. And that would be the people who are causing the harm, not on the people who are experiencing it. So that can, that can just be a really helpful piece of information to keep in mind, as well as um, very, very helpful for the other person to hear. Because we're all kind of steeped in lots of misinformation about sexual assault, who does it, the causes of it, what consent even is. And it's very likely that that person who has experienced sexual assault is experiencing some self-blame as well. Saying things like, um, or maybe thinking or feeling things like, well, I said yes. Does it count as sexual assault? Then like, I, I agreed, technically. We hear that a lot here at CIS. And so, you know, if we're ever in that kind of situation, we can say to people, um, like actually, you know, I learned in a session, or maybe you already knew this before too, that actually it doesn't matter if you say yes, what matters is if you wanted to. And it's not okay for people to force you to agree to sexual contact that you didn't want to have. It's not okay for them to pressure you, to guilt you. So that's another phrase that you can use as well, um, or another piece of information that you can draw on as well, that kind of all comes back to this idea that it's not that person's fault. And that can be so, so, so helpful. The next one too here is just coming back to that support piece, just I'm here for you. And to it, it's okay as well as a support person to have some boundaries on this too. You know, for example, if you're driving, maybe you can't talk to that person if it's too late at night. And then it can be helpful to possibly brainstorm with that person who else they can call. And so we are going to talk about some resources here in just a moment. But um also, too, like outside of community resources, maybe that person has a list of people who they know they can reach out to should they need to. Maybe it starts with you. And then maybe if you're not available, they go to the next person and they, they can just kind of go down the list if they need to talk with somebody and people just aren't available for very normal life situations. Or two, possibly somebody isn't available because um, it can be really, really difficult to, to know that somebody has been hurt in this way. And something that I like to say about that as well is that if that's the case for people, that is so normal to feel impacted after experience or after hearing about somebody's experience of sexual violence. Um, and there's so many reasons why that might happen. So all of the resources that I'll talk about today are also available to supporters as well in case they need some some extra support too. We'll get to that. And then yeah, here, how can I help you? Again, that might just be listening, that might be um, making them food for a little while, buying them dinner if they need that, if, if that's feasible for you, that can be, um, I think I mentioned listening, community resources, maybe a drive to counseling, whatever, that, there could be so many different things. And it might be difficult for that person to know right in the moment. And if that's the case, that's okay as well. So I guess in the end, just if we start with these basics and just never underestimate the power of these really simple supportive phrases and actions, that, that's enough. This is more than enough. And that people will be just be so grateful that we're there to support. Um, and there's just a couple pieces here that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned as well. No, you know what, actually, I touched on everything. Thanks for your patience while I looked at that, but that's everything that I wanted to say here. 
And the next piece here where we'll spend about 10 minutes or so is talking about different resources that are available. So I know that folks are here from outside of Alberta as well. A lot of the resources I'll talk about today are specific to the Edmonton area, but there are equivalent resources out there as well. And I would be happy to talk about those in the question period if I, if I know of any, so you can feel free to ask me that stuff too. But also I will mention that you might be familiar with the 211, Alberta's 211. Basically, people can call that number and ask about any resource in any area of Edmonton, and that line will know what's there in that area and can tell you about it. It's a really, really great resource that we have here. But we'll move forward. And the first set of resources that I want to mention are ones that are actually here at SACE. We always like to let people know in our sessions some of the uh, different services that we have available, not as a, as a plug, we are, because we don't make money from this at all. It's a nonprofit, but it's just so that people know that we exist and that we're out there. So I already mentioned to you that SACE exists to support people who have experienced sexual violence and to engage communities to promote, respect, and uphold a culture of consent. So that is really our mandate right there, those two things. And all of the services that we provide are always at no fee. We can accept donations or honorariums, but we never want somebody to have to pay for these things because we don't think that somebody should have to. So there are three things on this list that are specific to people who are um, supporting somebody, sorry, in that like maybe receiving a disclosure. So we'll talk about those ones first. The first one is the support and information line. So that's a phone number that people can call any day of the year. So even like it's a holiday and everything else is closed, our line is available and it's available between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. If anyone here has been really familiar with our services, then you might remember that this phone number used to be a 24 hour phone number. And that's really amazing for a lot of different people who needed support throughout the night and early in the morning. The only reason that we shifted it is because of capacity and um, we didn't quite have enough capacity to be able to keep the line open that long anymore. So for the time being, it's 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. This line is operated by people who go through extensive training, um, 60 hours of training at the very least. They probably have other experiences as well to be able to talk with people about things related to sexual assault, to trauma, to legal options. Um, and it always comes from, again, that non-victim blaming framework and also from an anti-oppressive framework as well. So it's a really, really great resource for folks. And so somebody, lots of different people can call this line. So that could be people who they themselves have been experienced or sorry, have been affected and experienced sexual violence. Maybe it was recently or maybe it was a really long time ago. Maybe somebody's memories are just coming back or new memories are coming up. Whatever the situation is, anything at anything at all connected to that. Um, as well, people who are supporting somebody can call this line. So I mentioned that that can be really, really impactful to hear a disclosure, to hear that this has happened to somebody that we care about. So you can just call this line and talk about yourself. Say, my friend told me this. It was I'm so, so, so upset. I can't believe that this is happening. And we can just be there to support you as well. In addition, of course, it's called the support and information line. So people can also call this line if they just have questions about what's going on. Like, you know, a lot of the sexual assault and consent information that's kind of fed to us actually comes from the states and sometimes their laws are different. So it can be really confusing. Maybe, maybe people have questions about that or just questions. Maybe after our time together today, you have a question and you didn't feel comfortable asking in this space or asking me, or you just didn't think of it until after, you could call this line as well any day between nine and nine and have like a full on conversation about that thing. That's very, 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 um, you're very welcome to do that. We want you to do that. The next one here that is applicable when we're receiving response, or sorry, you're receiving disclosures is second from the bottom. This is our court support program. And it's actually called Usually it's called our police and court support program because the advocates can help in both of those different situations. This is an amazing resource that we're really happy to have here at SACE, where basically anybody who's 16 and older, who has experienced sexual assault and is considering reporting it as one of the options, or sorry, as one of their responses to that thing happening, can reach out and um, talk with somebody, talk with one of our advocates. And so basically the advocate can provide information about what that person can expect in the reporting process can um, provide emotional support throughout that reporting process and even just as they're considering it. And they can even attend court proceedings with people. And so I think that lots of people here have been to the court building 
I don't know, I've only been there twice and both times I was completely lost. I was absolutely hopeless. And I had to ask at least two people to help me get to where I was going. <laughs> and so it can just be so helpful to have somebody be there with you who already knows where the rooms are, where the bathrooms are, which elevator you use, there's so many there. So yeah, it can just be so helpful to have that person there. And the advocates in this program are very, very kind and compassionate people. And so you don't have to be, somebody just doesn't have to be a client at SACE, like they don't have to be receiving counseling at SACE, which we'll talk about next in order to access this service. Instead, it's anybody in Edmonton who's 16 and older. And the only reason we don't see people who are under 16 for this program is because the Zebra Center has a comparable program for folks who are younger. So that's an, another resource that can be reached out to as well if you're ever receiving a disclosure from a younger person under 16. The next thing that I want to, to touch on, and I think this is what we're the most well known for, is our counseling. So our counseling, like all of our, our services, is offered at no fee. No one ever has to pay for this. And it's available to anyone who has experienced any kind of sexual violence, like I mentioned. It could be sexual assault, like we talked about. Maybe there were verbal comments in the workplace or out on the street, whatever that might be. Maybe they had a photo shared around and they didn't want that to happen. Could have been child sexual abuse as well. Just anything at any point in their life. It's okay if it happened a really long time ago or if it happened two days ago, it doesn't really matter. And we also, like I mentioned, see anyone. So sometimes when people hear that I work at Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton, they assume that only adult women would ever go there. But we actually support people of all genders and almost all ages as well. So we start to see people as young as age three, little tiny munchkins. And then of course, there's no age cap on how old somebody can be. And so for those two different yeah, there's two different programs for counseling and SACE. There's the little ones like age three and then up into adolescence, 17. And then we also have 18 and plus, so our adult counseling program. And um, counseling for those two different groups of people can look really different. For example, um, I wish that I could show you, we actually, we have a, a play therapy room here, which is just the most magical space. And I wish that I was in there right now. It's painted with this beautiful blue sky. There's this big tree in the middle and there's just like tons of toys. There's puppets, there's a sand tray, there's little figurines. People will also do like art and things like that in there. There's a sink to wash everything up. And it's just such a sweet place. And so for a lot of little, little kids where it's maybe difficult to, they don't even know what words to use to describe what happened or how they're feeling, play therapy can be so, so helpful for them. And also too, sometimes adults hang out in there as well, which is so great. And there's also talk therapy. There's lots of different modalities used here at SACE and they're always professional counselors. So they at least have their masters of counseling. They might have their PhD as well. Sometimes people think that because our services are free, then it's just not just, but it's volunteers or, or people maybe who don't have um, a master's degree in counseling who are supporting folks, but that's not the case here. So that's the information I wanted to give you about SACE. And I see, yeah, we have just a, a couple minutes left here. So I'm going to touch on a couple of other options that you can let people know about as well out in the community. Sometimes after someone has experienced a sexual assault, they need or want medical attention, medical care and help. If that's the case, then that's what we're gonna talk about with the top row here. So we see SART and we see birth control center and STI clinic. So I in particular wanna talk about SART because this is a really special program we have here in Alberta. Started in Edmonton, it's in a couple of other places as well and is starting in a couple more places here in Alberta. And it stands for Sexual Assault Response Team. So this is a team of nurses who their whole job is to help people who have very, very recently been sexually assaulted. That's literally all they do. So they know how to talk with people. It's trauma-informed care. You might've heard that before, which is just considering different trauma impacts that somebody might be experiencing while giving care to somebody. And um, so all somebody would have to do, say you're supporting someone and they're like, oh, I think I want to get checked out for something. You can let them know about this. And all they'd have to do is go to any emergency room in the Edmonton area, let the person in charge there know, well, that they want to see a SART nurse. So they might say that, they might see, say, I think I've been sexually assaulted or whatever, however they phrase it is totally okay. And somebody can... Um, yeah, call the start nurse. They're always, always on call. So sometimes it takes around an hour for them to come. Sometimes it's a little bit sooner. It might be a little bit longer if they're currently with somebody, but they'll come as soon as they can. And that person can provide um, 
lots of different medical care. So internal examinations, external examinations can do STI testing, um, pregnancy testing, if that's a concern. Um, can also collect a biological evidence kit for people if they want to maybe report in that moment or report later on. They can also facilitate a report in that moment and they can call an officer from the sex crimes unit of EPS and that person can come to the hospital. I, as far as I understand, usually they're not uniformed as well, which can be nicer for some people. Sometimes it's kind of scary to see a police officer in a uniform. Uh, so that's an option as well. But something that I'll say that is true for all of SACE services and SART as well is that none of us think that people need to report. We have a court support program for people if they want that. SART can facilitate a report if somebody wants to do that, can collect evidence if somebody wants to do it later on. But there will never be pressure to report for an adult who's experienced something like this or for somebody who's currently an adult, even if it happened when they were a kid. And so reporting is not um, mandatory for people to access services here at CIS and also for SART as well. So uh, that's that program. There are a couple different caveats, though, that we like to share with people. If you don't remember these, that's OK. You can also look it up before offering that resource or with your friend or whoever you're supporting. Somebody has to go within seven days of the sexual assault happening. If it's been longer than seven days, they can get all the same type of care just at different places, which I'll talk about next. But if somebody also wants to get the, the evidence kit done, then they actually have to go within three days of the assault happening, which can be difficult for people. If that's not realistic for them, that's completely okay. As well, um, this piece can be pretty tricky and it's absolutely not necessary, but generally speaking, if somebody wants to have evidence collected, we can let people know that it's better to not shower after what happened. It's very rare, you know, for that to feel comfortable for people. If somebody is showered, it's completely okay. And it's often pretty likely that they're able to find evidence anyway. So, but you can just kind of let people know that it's a conversation that you can have with people. So if it's been longer than the seven days and SART is no longer available, people can go to the birth control center and get pregnancy tests, um, any type of birth control that they might want to have there and also get tested at STI clinics. They can go to a doctor's office and talk with their family doctor. All the same supports are available out there. This is just a specialized program for immediately after an assault happens. Next to we have the police and we know that people don't need to report if they're adults, they can choose that. And there's no pressure for somebody to, to do that. And there's no time limit to report in Canada. So we like to let people know about that as well. They can report half an hour later or 30 years later, and that's equally as valid in the, in the eyes of the law. And then lastly, we have CACE as well. I've already talked about us enough, but right beside us there is the Alberta's One Line for Sexual Violence. This is really, really cool because it's basically a support line just like ours, but they have two cool features. One is that people can actually text that phone number. That can be a lot more comfortable for a lot of people. Or somebody can do an online chat, which is accessible from our website, sace.ca. On the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little yellow button there um, that people can click on and then chat and get that kind of support there. Again, it can be more comfortable for some people than like talking on a phone with somebody. So that's what I wanted to share about you regarding our uh, safe services here, or sorry, our, our safe services and also community resources. But where I wanted to end things is with this very last slide here which is that I, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning, this is a really heavy topic. And often people um, try to kind of keep this type of information at arm's length because it can feel really overwhelming and hopeless. And sometimes people say like, oh, you work at a sexual assault center, that must be so sad. But it's actually the opposite because here at SACE, we operate from a distinctly hopeful perspective. So we know that with love and support, People who experience this kind of violence can and do heal and move forward in their lives. And we get the privilege of seeing that every day here. So it's very much the opposite. So I wanted to say thank you so much for your time and your attention coming here from so many different places in Alberta. And um, I actually have a link to an evaluation that I would like to share with you folks as well that in a moment here, I'll pop into the chat, possibly during the, the Q&A period. But this evaluation, you can tell me if you learned anything, um, if you like something I talked about, if you didn't like something I talked about, just it really, really helps us inform our future presentations and is really important for our funders. Of course, all of our services are no fee, so we need to let our funders know what we're doing and, and how people in the community are responding. So please do fill that out if you have an opportunity. But for now, I will pass things back over to the host so we can continue on with our evening.
Okay, Shannon, thank you so much. That was incredible, extremely informative, very educational. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart and thank you uh, from the Lois Hole Women's Society as a whole. Um, I think we all took so much from that talk. Um, so for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Crystal Jacob. I am a proud supporter of the Lois Hole Women's Society, and I am also co-chair of the Development Committee for our society. Um, so for this evening, I will be moderating our question and answer period. Um, so if you have any questions for the lovely Shannon, we would love for you guys to put them in the Q&A box, um, and we will go through those. Um, so I will get started on what we have. Um, so firstly, thank you for this really helpful seminar. Um, and someone is asking, would I be able to, to have permission to share some of these PowerPoint slides to my community circle or on social media? A lot of the resources and graphics are simple and accessible to look at. What a great question. Thank you so much for uh, wanting to do that. I, uh, that means so much to me. What I'll say is that I, I also love these PowerPoints very much. We actually have a whole team who whole, their whole job is to make things beautiful, which I'm grateful for because I don't have any skill in that way. But we also actually have like on our social media, it, this also sounds like another plug, but it's, it's truly not. We have Instagram, we've got Facebook and also Twitter, if people use that still. And um, we actually have really, really great graphics on there as well that folks are welcome. You know, you can take a screenshot of it. You can share it in your stories or share um, on your own feed if you want to do that, just kind of crediting safe. So I would actually recommend getting um, images and things like that from there. But I am also going to put in the chat a resource specifically around supporting adults who have experienced something like this. It's like a handout that I'm going to share with you. I'll put it in there in just a sec. So hopefully it doesn't get lost in the messages. Also, I'll say our website is also very beautiful and has a whole learn section too that with like tons of links and tons of articles that we've written. Some of them I wrote. Um, some of them are just like, you know, handouts. So you can also share those with people. I think that that's, I would recommend doing that instead of these slides. There's lots more information on there. Thank you for asking about that. Awesome. That's great to know that um, you have those resources available. Um, so the next question is, why is the most common response to freeze in response to sexual assault? Yeah, another great question. And, you know, I feel like all of these different things I talked about today, I could have spent so much longer talking about. But um, one thing that, you know, one reason that I mentioned um, in, in the presentation, just very, very briefly, so I think it kind of just kind of flew under the radar. But, I mean, we one of the biggest reasons is because we know that the stat is 85% of the time when a sexual assault happens, it's not between strangers, they actually know each other. And it's not just the case that somebody knows that person, but usually there are lots of really strong feelings there. It's often a partner, it's often a friend, maybe it's an acquaintance, but there's some kind of trust that happens there. And that trust can be so confusing for our little instinctual part of our brain back here to, to understand. So um, it gets confused. And it can be really hard to determine like, oh, this is a safe person, but now this person's hurting me. How do, what do I do? What do I do? And it just kind of freezes. And when somebody freezes, um, there are different things that the body experiences that are actually really helpful. One of them is this kind of dissociation. So we can imagine that that can be helpful if we're experiencing something really scary so that maybe it's not as impactful. Maybe we don't physically feel things as much or emotionally feel things as much while that's happening. So that's a really um, good thing to have and can also lead to those like struggles with remembering exactly what happened as well. So there's good things and bad things to all these different ways that our body instinctually responds. Um, but I would say that that's the number one reason why it's so common specifically with sexual assault as opposed to maybe physical assault or something like that. Yeah, that's a great question. A really okay. common question. Yeah. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, so our next question, um, regarding lying or being accused of lying, it is also common that a survivor of sexual assault becomes hypervigilant to notice or and punish other people that they think are lying. Um, perhaps since a long-term abuser pressured them to lie and hide assault. Is that something that um, you find is 
truthful? Yeah, I can absolutely understand where that's coming from. And I think like there's a few different pieces in there. Um, and one thing that I'll say is that I don't know if this will be super satisfying for the person who who kind of had that comment. But what's coming to my mind is that it's so, so, so common for people to honestly just assume right away that somebody who says that they were sexually assaulted is lying about it. And that happens for a lot of different reasons. But because so the point I want to make is that because that's so common for people, it can also be true for people who they themselves have experienced something like that. So they might think that somebody else is lying, um, even though they themselves have experienced something like this. So and that's just a really tricky thing to navigate and to kind of work through. Um, so I, I don't know if that super intelligently speaks to that kind of thing coming up, but that's one thing that I'd say it's just it's common for anybody to to have that kind of misinformation what i what we call like misinformation about how often people lie i guess or if they are yeah okay yeah um and the next question kind of touches on it as well um you mentioned that around 98 percent of folks who disclose they are telling the truth um you mentioned you could speak more on this um so they would be interested to learn a little bit more Great. Oh, I'm so glad that you asked. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, like I mentioned, there has been extensive research done on this. So basically people went around to a bunch of different police precincts. They gathered data and they looked at um, different reports of sexual violence or sorry, specifically sexual assault. And they used really specific definitions and criteria to determine whether or not a report counts as a false allegation. So for example, sometimes reports are categorized as um, a word that I'm not going to remember that I'm sure many other people here know, unfounded. Um, so like there's just not enough evidence to tell whether or not what's going on. And sometimes cases like that, they're determined a false allegation, but they're, they're not necessarily. There isn't anything about those situations that suggests that that person was lying and saying that somebody did something when they actually didn't do it. So that's kind of like one of the pieces that the report looked at. It's actually, there's a summary of all these different um, studies that were done that um, is accessible out there. And uh, so that's, yeah, that's that piece. And then can, was there anything else I can say about that? Um, I will say too, like the stat they had was 92 to 98% of the time people are telling the truth, which means that it's only two to 8% of the time that it's found to be a false allegation. And the 8% is more of an outlier um, with this, the precincts that they looked at. So it's actually more the case that's closer to the six to 2%, which again, is just a small difference, but is also, I think, important when I share about these stats. So that's a bit more information. If people have more questions or comments, please do let me know. And there's also lots of information about it on our website too, in case that answer wasn't quite satisfying enough. But yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so our next question, um, could you possibly speak more about when boundaries are unclear or when they are only partially crossed? Is this sexual assault if you say yes to some actions but not to others or say no initially but say yes just to appease them? Right. Another really great question. And you know, when it comes to our conversation about consent, there's a lot of different things that we can talk about here. So what I got from that question, um, and I might get you to repeat it too, just to make sure I'm getting to everything in a second. But um, one thing that's standing out to me is that consent actually needs to be ongoing. So just because I'll use myself as an example, because it's easiest, just because I agree to make out with my partner, doesn't mean that I'm agreeing to do anything more with them. And each different type of sexual activity needs to be checked in on. That's true as well for just because on Tuesday night I'm into it doesn't mean that on Friday night I'm into it and somebody can't right. say like, hey, no, but you wanted to do this exact same thing three days ago. Somebody's not allowed to say that and then try to make somebody agree. It's actually okay for people to not want to do certain things at certain times or to want to do certain things and not do other things. So that's completely okay. And no one's ever allowed to say those things and like make somebody feel like they have to agree. Um, and yeah, kind of like, I remember like partially crossed the crossing boundaries or something like that. And so what I would say to that is like here at CACE, we would look to the individual person experiencing that and know that you're the expert in how you feel. Nobody else knows how somebody feels. 
And if it felt bad, like it felt like they were crossing your boundaries, you tried to communicate no, and they're not listening, then you deserve support for that. And you can use whatever words that you want to use to describe that thing happening in home. Like that's just a huge thing for somebody to think through and contend with. Um, so it's okay to take time with that kind of idea. Um, I'll also say too, you know, we didn't talk a lot in this session about the different ways that people communicate no. I did mention it can happen through body language or through words. But what we know is that someone is, always communicating that they're uncomfortable. And it's actually not their job to say no or communicate no well enough. It's always the responsibility of the person who's pursuing the sexual contact to make sure that the other person is okay. So they need to be looking at somebody's body language at the way that they're communicating. Like as a quick example, I think it's really easy for us to tell here, just in this room, the difference between, yes, absolutely, oh my gosh, like I'll get undressed right away, versus like, um, sure, I guess so. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody can check in about that. And so, yeah, whatever kind of boundaries were crossed, if maybe they were crossed, if it feels uncomfortable, again, we would be here to support anybody in any type of situation like that, yeah. No, I think that that absolutely answers it. That's good. Um, okay, so our next question is directed towards the parent-child relationship. So as a parent, I want to be a safe place for my kids to talk if they ever experience a sexual assault. Maybe this may be a bit outside of what we're talking about, but do you have any advice for being a supportive parent in this way? Oh my gosh, what a beautiful question. I appreciate that so much. And I appreciate where that's coming from. Um, I absolutely do have information about that. And I think probably, so I put in the chat a resource for responding to disclosures from adults. There's also a resource we have responding to disclosures from children. And so um, that's some information about how um, we can be in that conversation. So I'll put that in there as well. Um, and then in terms of being, um, I'm sorry, can you say it again? Like being a certain kind of parent, I think. Um, sorry, I just put it down. Uh, if you can't find it, that's okay. that's okay. Just do you have advice for being supportive as a parent in that way? If, totally. If yeah. Okay. And so, yeah. So what I'll say to that piece in general, like I'll put that document in the, in the chat, but I'll also just say, um, like the fact that you're asking about this and wondering about it means that you're probably already a really supportive parent. So like those instincts, that you have there, you can listen to those. And just like being open that they can talk to you, they might not choose to, but them knowing that you can, they can is just like, sometimes that's all we can do as well. And then maybe being somewhat prepared sort of for if they do talk about something like this. Um, so yeah, and that's when that, that maybe that handout that I'll put in there can be helpful. There's lots of different tips for, for adults who are hearing that a young person has been harmed. And I can imagine too, I'll just acknowledge that, how much the feelings associated with hearing that a child has been harmed could be compounded and magnified if it's your own child. And again, just if that happens, we're here to support parents too through this can call the line um, and everything there too as well. So I'll get that document right now, maybe while the next question is being, being read. Um, so we have a couple questions in the chat box. Um, is it possible to be sexually assaulted virtually? For example, being coerced into sending photos um, of self, et cetera. Great question. I just got this little document here. Uh -huh. this here. So that's for children and youth. Um, so yeah, I saw that question there too. What a great question. So when it, like what I'll say is, no, I'll start here. So yeah, when we're talking about sexual assault, we are actually talking specifically about physical touch and physical contact, like body to body contact. Um, that being said, it is absolutely possible for somebody's boundaries to be crossed in a virtual setting. And there are different laws about that. So the se sexual assault is in the criminal code of Canada. And so too are things related to photo sharing and what that's or like, well, you could call it photo sharing, whatever you want to call that. So like, yeah, oh yeah, it does talk about photos specifically. So what that law says in essence is that it's always, always illegal for someone to 
like share around somebody's photos or get photos without the consent of the person in the photos or who would be taking the photos. So everything that I talked about regarding consent, that it needs to be voluntary, it can't be coerced, it can't be pressured or manipulated or guilted into, all of that also applies to any kind of sexual or intimate photo or video as well. So it wouldn't be called sexual assault. There are various laws that that would fall under, but it's also illegal for that to happen and it reportable therefore as well. Yeah, and people can get support at SACE for that too, call the line counseling. Yeah, good question. Um, okay, so our next question, um, and I think that this comes up pretty often, how is the role of alcohol perceived in the role of consent? As professionals like yourself um, who work with survivors and help to prepare them for further disclosure. Yeah, absolutely. So how is the role of alcohol perceived in the role of consent? Yeah, you're right. This is a really common question, Crystal. And uh, yeah, thanks for, for asking that. So not only does our law define what consent is, that it's a voluntary agreement to engage in sexual activity, it also talks about five really specific times where consent just isn't possible. So five of them. One of them is if somebody is incapacitated by drugs or alcohol. So what that law is getting at is that somebody can't be too drunk or too high to consent. So um, one way that we talk about that is we say like, you know, I mean, we have probably various experiences with alcohol and drugs and can tell in various situations if somebody maybe is too drunk, if somebody is acting really differently from how they normally do, their eyes are glassed over, they're going in and out of consciousness, all of these different things. Um, and if somebody is too drunk to consent, then they just, they're, they're deemed incapable of consenting and it's never okay for somebody to take advantage of that person or to purposefully get somebody super drunk or high in order to take advantage of them. And thankfully it's not, well, the, it, it's not much more complicated if the person pursuing the sexual contact is also super drunk. So like it's always the responsibility of the person pursuing that sexual contact to make sure that the other person is okay and consent and can consent. So let's say I'm in this situation, I'm interested in somebody, they're intoxicated, I'm also intoxicated in some way, I still have to make sure that I'm 100% certain that they are in a clear enough state of mind that they can consent. Mm -hmm. So then that means that I have to be looking at them and analyzing their behavior. I also have to be thinking about me and analyzing my behavior. Like, am I too drunk to be making this decision? Am I too high to be thinking this through clearly? So am I acting really differently? Did I just throw up or something like that? All these things. So I still have to think about that. And it's never an excuse for somebody to say, well, I didn't know that they weren't consenting because I was drunk too. Because being drunk typically isn't a defense against committing crimes. And that's the, it's the same case here. So just like if I'm intoxicated, I have the responsibility to not um, like rob a bank or something like that just because I'm dry, I don't know what, but whatever, whatever the crime might be, I also have a responsibility to make sure that I'm not hurting anybody in any other way as well, including sexual assault. So that's kind of a brief overview of how alcohol and consent work together. And our website also has a lot of information about that too, if you ever find yourself interested in just kind of perusing that stuff on there. But yeah, great question. That was a really good explanation, actually. Um, you know, you don't get to commit crimes because you're intoxicated, right. bottom line. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so is there anything else that you would really like people to know that you didn't have time to touch on? That was a question. Oh, that was a question. Oh, my goodness. Well, I feel like every time I talk about this, I wish I could talk about literally everything that's in my head that I know about this topic. So let me just think for a moment here. Um, is there anything else? Oh, I feel so much pressure. <laughs> to think of something like very, very interesting. Um, I think you provided us with a lot of information, so don't feel any pressure to add anything else. Well, thank you, for, thank you for that. I'm, I'm just going to um, just spend maybe 20 more seconds just kind of thinking about this here. Um, I think probably the only other piece is, um, you know, talking about 
well, not the only other piece, but I mean, I had already kind of mentioned how, you know, there are five specific times where people can't consent. Of course, I'm so glad that somebody brought about, uh, brought that up about alcohol. Um, but I guess I'd also want to talk about how um, people can't consent. Like nobody can consent for anybody else, which sounds very mm. straightforward. Like only I can consent for me, but that actually wasn't always the case. Like until 1984, if people were married, then they were considered to be in a constant state of consent with each other. And somebody could not report a sexual assault against the person that they're married to, which that is wild to me. That is very, 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 very recent. Um, and so, but at that time it was changed and it means that, um, yeah, it's just never okay to assume somebody's consent. And yeah, we can only consent for ourselves. The fact that we're in a relationship with somebody else does not do that consent for us. So yeah, that's a really important piece that I like to bring up. Um, I'm trying to think of one more, maybe that I'll say, <laughs> um, is just that there's also the issue too of like an abuse of power that comes up a lot in this topic as well. So just of course, yeah, to very briefly touch on that, um, somebody's never allowed to abuse their position of power to make somebody agree. Um, and that can actually look a lot of ways that people might not expect. So when I say abuse of power, people often think about a boss, an employer um, for kids. Sometimes it's like a coach, a babysitter, a family member, a parent, um, a doctor can be a police officer, um, all these different things people often think about. But one thing that we always like to add is that social power is also part of this as well. So this will sound kind of cheesy, but this idea of popularity, maybe somebody's really, and like, I know we're adults, maybe you don't use that word as much or think about that as much, but we're all very aware of those different dynamics that are happening in a group. And somebody might be considered, they might be really well liked, they're really um, charismatic, they have access to things like boats or cool houses or something like that, or they're just really funny or really nice and people like them. And if somebody abuses that position of social power to make somebody agree, that's also not okay. So of course that could sound like somebody threatening to like exclude somebody from something really important, which of course too, if we can imagine that that's in a workplace and that could have other consequences as well that kind of cascade from there. Um, so I guess, yeah, I've asked that question. Those are the two that I'd want to touch on as well. Um, just the abuse of power situation that only we can consent for ourselves too. And you know, there's more information about that on the website as well. Um, okay, yeah. Excellent. We are all going to check out the CACE website after Great. this. <laughs> we'll the numbers on our website. That's always good. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, that was great. So on that note, I think we will wrap things up. Um, of course, if you have any more questions, you can reach out to the Lois Hole Women's Society um, or the contacts that um, Shannon has provided for us. So I want to take the opportunity again to say thank you from the bottom of my heart um, to our speaker, Shannon, our attendees, our panelists, um, for continuing to make this uh, event and community amazing. Um, we learned so much tonight. I would also like to add if anyone would like to become a supporter of the Women's Society, um, we would be grateful for that. We would love to have um, more members of our society. Um, you can reach out to us individually or um, visit our website, which is lhhwomensociety.com to sign up. Um, you can make donations or become a monthly supporter. Um, and I also want to say again, a big thank you to Alberta Blue Cross. Um, they have supported us in this series for a couple of years now, and we are so grateful for that. We would not be able to do that without our amazing supporters. And our next lecture will be on November 25th um, at 7 p.m. And we will talk about health at every size. And this will be both with a registered psychologist and registered dietitian. So again, thank you everyone for attending, um, wishing you a safe and wonderful evening and hopefully we see you all next month. Okay, thank you so much. Bye guys, thank you. Thanks everybody.